Thanks everyone for coming. My name is Seth Ladd. I'm a developer advocate with the Google, Chrome, and Dart team. Uh, I got into Dart because I have a background in structured programming. So my experience is actually a lot of Java, a ton of Java, Java and Spring. So it's really cool to come to kind of a home crowd audience. So that, that's nice. Um, then I got into Ruby on Rails, and then lucky enough to get this gig at Google and Chrome. But at that time, I wasn't really a JavaScript ninja or anything, and so programming the browser for me was a huge learning experience. Come to find out that I really, really enjoy it, but at the same time, I really miss the programming experience that I came to grow up with and expect uh, that is really productive tools and refactoring and the ability to uh, work with classes and libraries and static types and all this stuff. So I really miss that, but I love working on the web. And so when the Start project came along, I got really excited because it allowed me to get that programming experience I think most of us in this room uh, really love and feel productive with and still target what I would say is the most exciting uh, and uh, ubiquitous platform out there, the modern web. So today, this is all about what's new in Dart, your first class upgrade to web development. I always like to just figure out how many people are building mobile apps today, so just iOS or Android. Okay, uh, how many people would say you're a server-side developer? Okay, cool, all right, good. And my power is not running, so hold on. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Otherwise, it's gonna go to sleep every five seconds. Here we go. Okay, cool, it's just interesting to see the demographics out there because Dart has certainly been appealing to developers all across all these different platforms, and so we get a really good mixed crowd. So that's, and that's good, that's, that's what we wanna see. Okay, so first, what is Dart? Well, Dart's much more than a language. It's also a set of rich core libraries, really productive tools, a great web programming experience, a very fast new virtual machine, but probably most important to understand, Dart compiles down to JavaScript and runs across modern mobile and desktop browsers. So almost everything, maybe everything you're gonna see here today, compiles down so you can run it across the modern web today. Uh, I might be talking about some server-side Dart code. The other question was, why do I say almost? Dart also runs on the server. You'll see some of that in a little bit. Uh, that you'd obviously wouldn't make sense. Okay. So I want to start off by painting some pictures about what motivates us and some of the reception we've gotten from the Dart project. So I like to talk about this is a real-life story, someone that, uh, that talked to us about their experience. He, was to, he works in a bank. Uh, he, works, he writes a lot of internal apps for his internal customers. So he was telling us what's a typical uh, scenario here. So his boss will come to him and say, uh, hey, we need some reporting app. Can you start building a new, new web app? All right, so he's like, no problem. First thing I'm gonna go get is require JS, because I need some sort of modularity. Next, I need to go get Backbone, because I need some sort of client-side architecture. Then I need to go get Backbone Marionette, because I need some sort of additional functionality Backbone doesn't have. Then I need to go get jQuery because every single web project needs jQuery and whether you need it or not, some, some other dependency requires jQuery. And then you need modernizer for feature detection. And then you need moment.js to be able to parse dates and deal with date formatting. And then you need desk templates because you need to do some sort of client-side templating system. And then you need to go get phantom.js because you need to do automated browser testing. And then you need to go get jasmine because, well, you need some sort of architecture to write your unit tests in. Whew, okay, so now he's almost ready to get started. But then, of course, each one of these has a different set of docs with different ways of writing docs, hosted in different sites and different formats. So, all right, you're gonna go read all about these and learn each one of these in a completely different way. Okay, and now he needs to integrate all this stuff and make it actually work together, which um, is worse than it probably sounds because there's some duplicate functionality in here. So not only does he have to wire in all the libraries together, he needs to then decide do you want the collections library from library A or collection library from library B? All right, well, after all of that, literally he says, I just want to write web apps. So then he was happy to report to us that he found the Dart project and he could replace that teetering pile of different technologies with simply the Dart SDK and three other packages you can get from our package management system. And his quote is, things are consistent and clear. And so that really made us happy because that's exactly the kind of programming experience we want to give you guys when you want to build your totally awesome web app. But that was uh, an external developer working with a small team needs to write a lot of apps. What's the word, what's the report back from our internal customers? 
Well, inside Google, we write big and complex apps. Things like Gmail, Google Docs, these things are huge. Um, hundreds of uh, engineers working off across multiple time zones, up to millions of lines of code. These are big. So we built in Google lots and lots of layers to deal with this complexity. Like we don't want to build things like Gmail with vanilla JavaScript and HTML. So we needed to build things like GWT or Google Web Toolkit. We needed to build things like Clojure and Clojure Compiler and Clojure Libraries. We needed to build templating systems like Soy. This is all, you know, it all basically works. But what we found is that we don't have the productivity that we really desire. Um, no joke, some of the edit refresh um, times that some of our engineers are experiencing are on uh, order of 24 minutes. Imagine 24 minutes from when you make a change to when you can actually see that in your browser. That's less than productive. So we need to find a better way to build web apps. This is Google, surely we can do better. So this isn't the first time we've tried to approach the problem, and this isn't the first time others have tried to approach this problem. Things like CoffeeScript might uh, give you a better, say, syntax on top of traditional web programming. Efforts like TypeScript might give you better structure over traditional web programming. Things like GWT might improve a bunch of things, but they don't, you know, some people might say it's a step back in syntax. Dart, in our opinion, is the first effort that actually addresses and improves all of these different dimensions. Structure, syntax, semantics, tools, core libraries, and very important to our uh, internal engineers is the iteration times. Web development is fantastic. You can make a change and hit reload, and then you see that change. And we want to make sure we continue to give you that change, even if you're dealing with a million lines of code. And so in Dart, you're not required to compile anything to see these changes. OK, so before we get into all of what's new from over the past year in the Dart project, I want to give you guys a lightning tour of the syntax, the structure, and the semantics of the Dart language and libraries to kind of put you in the headspace here what this project is like. So let's look at the syntax. I like to say it's ceremony free. Uh, first of all, this is very familiar, right? Class, curly braces, semicolons. It looks like most of the languages we're writing with every day. It's also a terse language. When you get to build a new language, you get to say, what are some of the things that are maybe a little bit more ceremonial and fix that? Good example here is constructor parameters. If the constructor parameter name matches the name of your field name, you can simply say this.strength in this case. This is a lot better than doing this.x equals x, this.y equals y, repeat, repeat, repeat. It's that kind of ceremony that I think we can do a little bit better on. Now, this is one of my favorite features in that with methods, you can name a method pretty much every, anything you want, which is great. You can clearly convey your intent. But constructors are traditionally always named the name of the class. Now, in Dart, we give you named constructors. So in this case here, you can create a new bear hug, and it will set up the state for that hug, in this case, strength 100, big hug. OK, in Dart, we have op uh, operator overriding, so plus, minus, et cetera, et cetera. In this case here, where you take a hug, and we add it to our current hug, and return you a new hug. In Dart, we also have optional named parameters. Now, a lot of great scripting languages allow you to have optional parameters or named parameters. In Dart, we also allow you to have default values for those named parameters. In this case here, if you wrap the parameters in curly braces, then it becomes optional, named, and we've given a default value of 1. Another really awesome feature of the Dart project is the one-line functions. So in this case, fat arrow here. Fat arrow here says it's just syntactic sugar for curly brace, return, expression, curly brace. Uh, this is really fantastic because in Dart, as you would in a lot of web programming, deal with a lot of callbacks or one-line small little functions in response to some actions. You want to be able to do these things uh, very tersely. And finally, string interpolation as well in Dart. The dollar sign here, then variable, or you can put an expression there. And it's just a little bit nicer than having to do string concatenation or string builders. You can certainly do those things if you want, but we've got string interpolation built right in. So you see this kind of real sweet spot here between the heavily structured, now I would say ceremonial languages like Java or C Sharp, and on the other end of the spectrum, you have the highly dynamic languages like JavaScript or other dynamic scripting languages like Ruby or Python. Dart somewhere kind of in the middle there, pulling in features from both so that you get the structure you need so you can start with tens of lines of code all the way up to million lines, but also the terseness and the free from ceremony you get from the other uh, scripting languages. 
Now, Dart is its own language. It's not just uh, syn syntax pasted over traditional web programming. Dart brings its own semantics as well. And so we want to turn more of the what moments that you might encounter with traditional web programming, turn those into atom atomic, dinosaur, rock, nuclear explosion moments. So version on your left, bad. Version on your right, good. So here's some examples of what Dart cleans up. So only true is truthy. Everything else is false. Very simple, very simple rule to understand. In Dart, there is no undefined. There's only null. So it eliminates that whole confusing, confusion. There's no automatic type coercion in Dart, uh, like you might get in traditional web programming with double equals or plus, et cetera. So right there, eliminate a bunch of those kind of questions, the unfamiliarity. OK, so this is the pop quiz part. Uh, this is Dart code. Now, what would you expect as a logical, sane, straightforward developers that you guys are? I have a string I'm calling dot missing. There is no missing getter on string. What would you expect? Right, OK. Well, you would get an exception, a logical error at that point at runtime saying uh, string has no instance method missing. This is different than traditional web programming, which returns undefined and keeps on trucking, which leaves you to uh, find bugs very far away from the original cause of the problem. Like, I want to know that I called a method that doesn't exist right at that point. Here's another pop quiz. What happens if you access an array out of bounds, out of range of, a, of an array? Uh, of array? Well, as you might expect, a logical error, range error right there. OK, good. Uh, I'm sure we've all run into the problem in traditional web programming where you did something like this and you get back undefined. Did I put undefined in there? Uh, I pass undefined three, three levels down. Where did it go? Right at the call site, problem. OK, this is a little bit trickier. So let's see if we can walk through this. Variable scoping in Dart. This is Dart code here. So I've got a top level variable called foo. And then inside my bar function, I have an if and then a new block here, foo uh, is set to inside. And then I want to print foo. Now, what do you think will happen when I run this program? Which, what gets printed? Top level. Top level gets printed because in Dart, things are lexically scoped. Logical, sane, easy for you to statically analyze, easy for the tools to statically analyze. So hopefully you can see that you can give dark code to pretty much any developer out there, and they can look at it and learn it in under an hour. Very straightforward, very logical. Ah, so this is the kind of trickier one, right, of the previous one. We talked about lexical scoping. In Dart, also this is lexically scoped. So a common thing you have to do in traditional web programming is you always say this equals that, so you can get a variable that's scoped just to your function, even if the callback that you're working on, which in this case right here, uh, when a button is clicked, you're going to fire, or going to run this function here, which we'll call this dot atomic dinosaur rock. In Dart, it actually will call the atomic dinosaur rock on this, the object that you would expect it or, under, or want it to call. So these are just examples of how things work a little bit more uh, logically. OK, so that was the syntax. We talked about the semantics. Let's talk about the structure. We talked about functions and classes already, and we'll look at some of the others in a little bit. But I want to focus here on libraries. A, a nice improvement over traditional web programming today. In Dart, you get the concept of libraries, but they're, very, they're much lighter weight than the concept of packages in Java. In Dart here, you can just simply define a file as a library. You can import libraries that come from the core SDK. You can import your own files, which themselves are libraries. So right there, you've got the concept of modularity and the ability to namespace. But inside this file here, you can define as many top-level constructs as you want. You can define multiple classes in a single file. You can define a top-level function in your file, It'll giving you a very flexible way to organize your code. You no longer have to put one public class per file if you don't want to do that. OK, so that was the lightning tour. We're going to look at a lot of the new features. But uh, make sure you guys, if you have any questions, stop me and ask, and I'll be happy to answer it. Interactive is always good. Um, so with that said, let's look at what's new in the language. OK, so this is really common in web programming today. Here we're creating a new button. Well, A, in Dart you have actual constructors and classes, so we can give you a constructor for button element. That's kind of cool. But then you're always setting up the ID, you're setting up the text, you're setting up the classes, you're adding on-click handlers, and then you add it to a child. Well, in this case here, button, the variable name is repeated six times. It's a, little, it's a little much on my eyes, so I think we can do better. Well, since about this time last year, we added the concept of method cascades. This comes to us from Smalltalk. And it allows you, as developers, to 
pretty much any API now becomes a fluent style API. This is an API uh, design popularized by libraries like jQuery, where you want to just kind of chain these guys together. This is pretty close to chaining. This is cascading. And right away, you can see we've eliminated the need to repeat button over and over and over and over. But we can do a little bit better than this. We can actually eliminate the need to create a new instance, or sorry, a new variable thanks to cascades. Even though we need to create a new object and then initialize it, we can do this all in line. This is kind of a convoluted example here, but you can see where I can say new button element, dot, dot, id equals foo, right where I want to use the object from the expression new button element. This is great when you have to create a new object, initialize it with a couple of parameters or values, and then pass it to some function or, or, uh, or method. OK, moving on. So one of these things is not like the other, in that you have top-level object, you've got a class in here called persistable, and a class called hug. I'm sure this is sort of familiar to a lot of us. We've probably had to extend from some utility class at some point. Well, obviously, hug is not persistible, right? If you look at the is a relationship, hug is not persistible. You just want hug to be persistible. And you don't want to pollute your inheritance tree. Well, it turns out in Dart that you can do this thanks to the concept of mixins. So when I take persistible and make it a mixin, I don't pollute my tree. I have object, I have hug extend directly from object, and I can mix in the kind of functionality or behaviors that I want in my class. So here's how you would do this. So almost any class itself can be a mixin. Uh, you have to extend object, and you can't have any constructors. Then you can become a mixin. So here's abstract class persistible. Notice how it defines save and load, but it leaves to JSON up to whoever's going to mix in this class. Then it's easy to apply the mixin here. Extends object with persistible. OK, so now hug actually has the abilities of persistible. And it becomes very easy to use the methods that come from persistible. So this is really cool. I like this. Another new feature we've been working on is metadata annotations. A good example here is at deprecated. This should be pretty familiar to a lot of Java developers out there. Dart now has this as well. Your tools can read at deprecated, give you feedback right in the tools. Again, plays into the story of Dart is very toolable and productive language. Now, this is cool, but you yourself, it's very easy to find your own metadata annotations. So I'm going to use this new, the new feature we're working on here, lazy load libraries, to illustrate how you yourselves can create your own annotations that the tools can then consume and do interesting things with. So here we're going to declare that the library, mylib, is a deferred library. And we're going to do that by assigning it to a const variable called lazy. Then on my import of that library, I'm going to annotate that import with the at lazy metadata annotation. Now again, this at lazy is just a const object. So you can create any const object here. And then we're going to use our lazy loaded library here by saying lazy.load returns a future. When the library is loaded, then execute a bunch of code. Now, our tools like Dart to JS, which takes Dart code and compiles to JavaScript, can read in this file, look at these annotations, say, OK, so you want one JavaScript file here, but then you want the lazy load library, another JavaScript file, so that you can send down the initial small one, and then when the user's ready, go request the second JavaScript file. This is great for deployment time. It allows you to say, OK, maybe they don't need this functionality right at the initial load, so I'm going to mark that as lazy. And they'll pull it, in, pull it in later. OK, so what's new across the Dart libraries? Well, the question we got all the time, especially when it initially launched, is this is very cool. I love it. But can I access my JavaScript libraries? The answer is a resounding yes. Now, we had to build a system that allows Dart to interoperate with JavaScript in two different worlds. One world is a world where you're compiling all your Dart code to JavaScript. So you've got one execution engine, and you need to mix these libraries together. The other world is when you have two different virtual machines, a Dart VM and, say, V8 in Chrome. And you need to be able to have objects in one VM reference and talk to objects in another VM. Now, this gets a little tricky when you deal with garbage collections. So we had to come up with a way to do this uh, in our world here via proxies that allows you to interoperate with existing JavaScript libraries or use Dart functionality in your JavaScript libraries and not have memory leaks. That was really important to us. So here's an example of Dart code that interoperates with JavaScript. And then the bottom version is the kind of vanilla JavaScript. And what I want to illustrate here is how similar these two chunks of code are. This is an API that's sort of based on the Google visualization API. 
So in the Dart version on top, you reach out into the JS context and you go get one of those top level objects like Charts API. Then uh, you might have an array of data. Well, in the Dart world, you want to efficiently construct and pass around that array of data. So you're going to wrap it in a JS.array. Then you'll create a proxy on top of the JavaScript object that's living in the other world here, in this case, bubble chart. And then the really cool thing here is chart.draw data looks the same in Dart as well as JavaScript. And the nice thing about this is uh, the editor and the tools won't give you any warnings about types or anything. I mean, you can see here that JS proxy is really what you're working on, even though you're pretending that the proxy is a chart. And notice how you can call draw on that proxy. No one's complaining. This is the, this is the terseness, the ceremony freeness of the Dart language. OK, this is also quite new and very, very useful to framework authors. Mirror-based reflection. The neat thing about our reflection system we call mirrors is that it can work on source code as well as during runtime. So we use the mirror system, for instance, to generate our Dart docs, very similar to the concept of Java docs. We also use our mirrors at runtime to do things like delegate methods or ask in runtime, you know, what fields do a class, does a class have? So speaking about that, you can reflect on classes as well as instances at runtime. And you can introspect, like you might imagine, what's the name of this thing? What fields does it have? What parameters does this thing take? As well as you can invoke dynamically other uh, fun functions or methods on those objects. So as an example, let's create a logging proxy that uses mirrors to delegate down all calls to some delegate while logging every call to any possible method on that delegate. So Dart has libraries. So first off, let's import Dart mirrors. Next, we're going to get a mirror from some delegate object using the top level reflect function. And then no such method. So Dart has no such method in that if an object receives a call request, a request for a method, and he doesn't implement that method, he will then delegate to no such method. Now, the default implementation of no such method is be like, hey, I don't, you know, I don't have this method. But you can override that and do anything interesting that you would like. So we're going to capture all calls to this proxy here. We're going to log out, simply print out, hey, foo was called. And then via that mirror object, we're going to delegate the original call back down to the delegate. So this works in the case of creating a class greeter. And in my main method, uh, I'm going to create a greeter that's actually a logging proxy that wraps the greeter. And I'm going to call hello. Now remember, he's going to hit the logging proxy first. Logging proxy is saying, I'm, I don't implement hello. I'm going to call no such method. No such method says, great, I'm going to log this out. And then I'm going to delegate it down to greeter. And you get hello printed out. So that's our reflection in metaprogramming. And we expect to fill this out even more and more over time. OK, this is really cool. Now, we all know that the web is an asynchronous world. The web works on an event loop. And to keep your UI from blocking while you're doing interesting things, you have to deal in this kind of callback world. Or maybe you deal with, with web workers. Well, as you probably know, the more and more callbacks you introduce, the more deeply nested those callbacks get. And it gets very confusing. In fact, it has its own special name called callback hell. Well, in Dart, we think we can do better. In fact, we can think we can put you on a beautiful beach out there when you're dealing with async programming. So to illustrate here, let's look at a before and after. This is Dart code. And you can certainly write, write Dart code like this. And do stuff takes some sort of function. And then has to be, if do, deal with errors. I'm going to pass in another anonymous function here to this name parameter here. Well, we can definitely do better thanks to futures. The version on your left is just straight up callbacks. The version on your right is an object-oriented construct around expecting and receiving a value in the future. Now, once you have an instance of future that is an actual object that represents a callback or a value later, you can then work with this like many other objects. and becomes an easy API to wrap your head around. In this case here, when the future is done, then run a callback. And if the future has any error, catch the error. Like, this is very close to the asynchronous version of try catch well, we can do even better because futures chain. So the bottom right hand is the model that we use a lot in Dart programming. Do stuff returns a future, chain then, then chain catch error. This really looks like synchronous try catch code, even though this is purely async. All right, let's look at this in action, because that was kind of a simplistic example. But this is something that's not all too unfamiliar. Everyone knows the internet is all about getting cat pictures. So let's get some cat data. But then we need to go turn that into a cat picture. And then we need to go rotate it. And then we need to go draw it. 
And you want these things to happen in that order, but all of these are asynchronous, right? So in traditional programming, you'd probably have to nest them down, and now it's getting a little sore in my eyes. And then, God forbid, you should add error handling in here. So now it's got a lot of repetition. This code is very hard to read. Well, we can turn this into the future version, and things get a little bit more clear to understand. Each one of those functions or methods now returns a future, and due to chaining, I can chain those futures. And this is really cool. Notice how I can put a catch error at the end that handles any error or exception handled in any of the previous futures. So instead of duplicating a lot of work, you can uh, go ahead and write off of the chaining capabilities of futures. Futures also compose. A good example here is if I want to get two pictures, I want to wait for both of them to complete. How would I do that callback? Well, I've got to have some counter and then understand which callback was finished first and then check, am I done with all of them? Future has a nice static method, wait, hand, hand at any number of futures, and when all those futures are done, then, then, then catch error. So object-oriented constructs for one-time events, we built it right into the core library, and then all of our asynchronous methods and objects across the core libraries now use future. Of course, as you know, the more you bake it into the platform, the more all the other third-party dependencies and libraries can work in the same way. So now you don't have three or four different proposals for how do we do future-based APIs in Dart comes out of the box. OK, and I explained that. So futures are really cool for one-shot callbacks, but we also have the concept of streams for repeating callbacks. A good example of the future might be, go calculate some Fibonacci number and get back to me when you're done. Streams will be, hey, I'm reading bytes off a socket, so let me know every time there's some bytes, you know, give, me that, give me that data. Or every time there's a click, give me a stream of clicks to come off. So let's see this in action. Speaking about clicks, actually, let's look at on key press. So imagine I want to get notified every time someone presses a key in some text area on my web page here. So I'm going to query for that text area, say, OK, on key press, that returns a stream. Well, streams are great because you can chain them, transform them, filter them. In this case, I want to filter all key presses. I only care about the keys on the keyboard, not the, uh, not the odd keys here. But then, for every one of those key codes, I actually want to turn it into a string. So map the incoming series of events from key codes to strings. And again, map is returning another stream. And in this case, I only care about the first one. So here, I'm turning the stream into a future, which is neat. So the very first event, now future, wait for that. Then print it out. This is my first character. So kind of like uh, futures in that if you bake it into the platform, everyone else can use it. And once everyone else is using it, we get this great ability to kind of transform and pass one stream to another, and everyone's talking the same language. OK, so what's new in HTML? So a lot of this stuff has been in the core libraries, but I want to show you how you would actually use this stuff to build modern web apps with Dart. So I like this example here, because if you know what the JavaScript version of this looks like, you'll know that it's a lot longer and harder to understand. But this shows you a bunch of Dart features that we've already talked about all in action. Right here, audio colon true, video colon true. These are named parameters. Now imagine this was get user media true true. No one in this room would know what those true, those special flags mean. So these named parameters here are fantastic to give you guys the ability to actually read this code. And the fact that they're actual baked into the, um, the language, the tools can give you code completion on this. So when get user media is complete, then, so that returns a future. So now I've got some media stream, and I want to create a video element. Ah, method cascades in action. Go ahead and create the video element, set it up. And then here's the usage of streams here, onloaded metadata, listen. So listen to all events for onloaded metadata. So this is great. And the neat thing about this is the DOM, that is the API for the browser, looks and acts like Dart code. So if you know how to use the core libraries and the language of Dart, you know how to program the browser. And that was really important to us. OK, another good example here. This is really cool. So Who's lately sent over XML, over XML HTTP requests? Right? Almost no one. So we dropped XML. It's cleaner. Uh, but it also shows you how we've simplified AJAX programming. Much like J jQuery did for JavaScript, you just get it out of the box with Dart. So here, HTTP request, that request, set up the method, set up the request headers. Again, future. When that request is done, then get the request where I can print out the body or do whatever, and then catch error for any errors that might have happened, like a 500 from that, from that AJAX request. Another good example, just making DOM programming feel like Darko. OK, 
So those are some of the primitives. Those are how we've improved the actual APIs of the DOM. But there's a new a whole suite of really awesome web technologies coming down the pipe, collectively known as web components, that are going to fundamentally change the way we build web apps. Web components is a family of specs that helps give you actual encapsulation, something other platforms have had forever, but on the web we don't have today. Imagine today, if you wanted to use some sort of framework, it's going to give you some CSS. You would put that CSS at the top of your file. Now that applies to your entire page. When in really, reality, you just want the components from that framework. And you don't want those components to be mucking around in, in your page. You don't want those components' styles to be overriding the styles in your page. You also want the ability to set up real data binding between the models in your application and the fields and DOM properties in your page. Again, something that a lot of other platforms had forever. Well, this is all coming to the web, and it's on standards track, and we have cross-browser support for it. But it's going to be a little while until it lands everywhere. Well, the nice thing is Dart provides you all the polyfills and the compilation required to write with this new awesome world of web components and model-driven views and still deliver it across modern browsers today. Since Dart has to compile the JavaScript anyway, we can go ahead and compile this code the way you want to write it down into JavaScript for you. So let's look at an example here, data binding. Data binding here, the top is the Dart code. Well, we can use those annotations again and say, ah, class person, he's observable. So I want the system to watch for changes in and out of my class person, or all instances of person. I'm also saying, OK, I have a list of people, and I want that to be observable as well. So give me event notifications if my list gets added to or removed. And then down here is the little snippet of HTML that we care about here. We have a button, and we say, if the button is pressed, run this Dart expression here, add person. Uh, which is the same ad person as right here. And we have here the UL, and we want to create a template here saying for every P in people. And then double curly braces is a way to do data binding inside text. So data bind to whatever the value of a P.name is, and also bind it to the text field here. OK, so let, let's see this in operation here. I'm going to pull up the Dart editor. Now, you'll get this uh, with the open source Dart SDK. It's a completely rebuilt experience based on Eclipse, but there's also, uh, we'll go into it, but there's plugins for a lot of other browsers as well. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's see, do I care about this? No. I would like to show you people. Here we go. OK. So here's the, here's the same code, and I want to show you this in action here. So if I run this here, you can run your Dart apps from Dart editor in both Dartium which is a version of Chromium with the Dart VM installed. Or you can compile a JavaScript and pop it open in your uh, favorite browser. OK, so we're going to add a message here. And so it added a person into that list. And because the list is observable, he adds a new li right here automatically. I didn't have to write any of that code. Well, it's all blank here. But remember, I have two-way data binding between the form field here and what's up there. So hello, Jax. That's all live, too. Again, live two-way data binding. I didn't have to write any of this code. I didn't have to write any code for like on change handler, do this. Or I didn't have to write any code like, hey, if something gets added to the list, remove it, or, or tell my rest of the system. The Dart Web UI project gives you all this stuff. So that's pretty cool. But we can do even more. I talked about encapsulation. So that was just that was the basics of data binding. But I want to actually create reusable components. Thanks to custom elements, a, uh, a member of the family of the web component specs, I can create a custom element, extend the actual lexicon of HTML, and encapsulate the structure, the behavior, and the style of this custom element. So wh what does that mean? Well, OK, these are a little bit out of order, but I'll show them to you anyway. OK, so how do we use an actual custom element? Well, the version on the bottom here, div is click counter. I'm actually subclassing div. I'm saying this is a div, but it's also a type of, div of click counter. Now, where did that click counter come from? Well, I can use the uh, primitives built into HTML anyway, the link. And I want to import this custom element here, click counter, into my page. Well, what does this look like? OK. I can define in a custom element using the element tag. Again, HTML exists, and I've got tags, so I can reuse that stuff. Remember I said that custom elements encapsulate structure, style, and behavior. The structure of this custom element here is defined in this template tag. The behavior of this custom element is defined in this Dart file. Because Dart is object-oriented, I can say create a class counter component, extends web component. And this is the behavior that's associated with the click counter. And remember, I use it here 
and I've got count starting count. Okay, so let's see this in action as well. Clicks HTML, run as Dartium. Okay, so as I click this, this, this whole thing right here is the custom element. But remember, all I used in my page was div is click counter. Because the custom element defines his own structure that you see in the page, but the encapsulation boundary here is this element here we call the host element, this div here. So all that's kind of going on under the covers now of this div is hidden from your page, which allows you to create these reusable components that no one else can kind of muck in or touch, or these components can't muck up with the rest of your page. Now they become reusable, they become extendable. You can package up these custom elements in Dart's package manager and reuse them. Ah, so now, now web, web development actually gets interesting. Okay, cool. So the question, is this Dart specific? No. Again, the web components, data binding, custom elements, this is all stuff on a standards track that is being worked on by multiple browser vendors. We just happen to be able to give you all this new Shiny today, even though browsers don't actually implement this stuff yet, because we're going to compile all this down into the actual vanilla constructs of JavaScript and HTML for you. Uh, uh, no, everything here works across the modern web today because we compile all this down into vanilla JavaScript and HTML. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. If you cut and paste this into a browser, right, you need to include the libraries that make that work. But here's a good example. I'm going to run this as JavaScript to just illustrate this point. Now, this is regular stock stable Chrome. Uh, he doesn't know anything about the all the fancy new data binding stuff. He doesn't know anything about Dart, but you can see it all works. Because I've compiled and give uh, all the polyfills, right? We, I brought along the implementation with me. And as the browsers implement more and more of this stuff, I can drop some of the baggage that's required. Ugh, okay, go back. Okay, cool. Okay, so what's new in the tools and ecosystem? Well, we saw Chromium, uh, we saw Dartium there. And the feedback we get from our developers is that Dartium is really fantastic in allowing developers to completely cut out the compilation step. They have very fast iteration cycles through the vast majority of their development in that they stay in the editor, they stay in Dartium, thanks to the Dart VM, just reads in that Dart code and runs it. At the very last, say, 20% of their development, they then start invoking Dart to JS, compiling their app to JavaScript and testing across the wild. Now, we saw the Dart editor, which is one way in which you can write Dart code. Dart editor is great because it allows you to do refactoring and code completion and jump to definition and find in project and all that stuff that you would want to do with any sizable application. But the good news is you don't have to use Dart editor if you don't want to. We've got plugins across a variety of different editors, like Sublime, uh, Eclipse as an actual plugin, Vim, and then even IntelliJ and WebStorm have a Dart plugin as well. So hopefully your favorite editor has the ability for you to write productive Dart code. But if you don't want to go get an editor, and if you just want to try out Dart, one of the latest things that we've launched is try.dartlang.org. We've actually taken, so here's Firefox, which of course doesn't know anything about Dart, so this is all compiled to JavaScript. We've actually compiled Dart to JS, that compiler, with Dart to JS. So in here, you've got the compiler running as JavaScript. And live here, you can edit your code. There we go. And try out the language, try out the core libraries, even try out HTML programming without ever leaving your browser. This is really cool, it even works offline. We have app cache installed, so it's a really low barrier way for you to just see what Dart is all about. Okay, moving on in the tools and ecosystem stuff, we also have a full unit test library, full mock library. This is an example, there's a whole talk on, on testing and mocks I wish I had time to give, but it gives you an example of just how terse and ceremony free the unit testing is. We also ship a headless Chrome, which allows you to automate browser-based testing off of, say, your continuous integration or testing environments. A good example of a partner we've been working with, Drone.io, is a hosted continuous integration service that knows about Dart, has our headless Chromium, has a Dart VM, and it connects all up to Bitbucket and GitHub, so you get this great cycle of writing in Dart, deploying to Dart, testing in Dart, testing in your, in your headless browsers, and it all just works more or less out of the box. We've also been working hard on a package management system. It's a great way to get the ecosystem up and going. We affectionately call ours Pub because you play darts in a pub. And with Pub, you can download, manage, upgrade, and install third-party dependencies and packages. 
on our central hosting service, pub.dartlang.org, you'll find packages for MVC frameworks, templating, game engines, physics engines, you name it, database drivers. Uh, it's great to see the community get so involved so early on in the Dart ecosystem evolution, but there's already a ton there for you to try out. This is also really cool. We've been working with Adobe to see what we can do if we can take the great editing experience of, say, Flash Pro, which is great for animations and uh, timelines and great for creative folks, but who want to target the web. So they love the tools, want to target the web. They also loved ActionScript 3, but Dart is very familiar to ActionScript 3 developers, and Dart is coming to Chrome, and Dart compiles to JavaScript. So you can use tools like Flash Pro, author in them, actually write Dart code, and export the whole thing down to Dart, which then, of course, compiles to JavaScript or runs right on the VM. This is really, really cool. We see a lot of interest from ActionScript 3 developers who say, hey, man, I want to know what to do next, but I love my tools, and I love ActionScript 3. What should I do? Dart, they're finding, is a totally natural answer. And so this is going to be available, I think, by the end of the month. OK, cool. So that's a little bit about what's new with the tools. Let's look about something that's really near and dear to our uh, engineers' hearts, size and speed. Uh, the guys who co-founded the Dart project also co-founded and wrote V8, Chrome's fast JavaScript engine. They also wrote and helped work on Hotspot, the thing that made Java fast. So these guys know speed, and these guys have speed like, in their sites at all times. So you're probably asking yourself, OK, great, but I thought the web was fast enough. right? Aren't you telling me that Chrome is already fast? Well, certainly we saw a whole renaissance of more interesting apps come about because of V8's reintroduction of speed to the web. Once V8 was introduced, you see a bunch of other browsers get interested in speed, and then enable the whole slew of really amazing apps, like Google Docs, and uh, here's Google Maps, uh, pr the presentation software I'm using right now. Really cool multimedia experiences here, like Oz and the thing we did with Cirque du Soleil. So we've completely pushed the boundaries of what's possible on the web. Well, it turns out that what if you could double the speed again of your browser? What kind of renaissance would you be able to bring forth? What kind of amazing experiences would you be able to help your developers produce if you could double the performance? So yes, uh, web is fast, but we can definitely make it faster. But it's not just about, oh, uh, making your multimedia apps run faster, which of course is important, but it's also about this. Everyone's got one of these in their pockets, maybe even two, maybe two of these in a tablet. And probably this time next year, we'll be primarily developing for this. Now, this has a battery. It doesn't have one of these. I don't have the luxury of being able to keep this plugged in. Every CPU cycle counts on this guy because you don't want your users to uninstall your app because it drains your battery. And this is really important as we move into a mobile world. If you can get from what used to take four cycles down to one cycle, that's a huge improvement in battery alone, not, let alone, of course, actual felt performance. OK, so let's look at what we've done to help make things faster and smaller. Well, dart to js uh, has been doing a tremendous amount of work using the static and analyzable features of Dart to help produce small and fast JavaScript. Here's an example. You take your uh, application. You run it through Dart to JS, it performs tree shaking, minification, type inferencing, and spits out not only the JavaScript code, but also a source map file, which allows you to stick inside Chrome DevTools and debug, what the, debug the original Dart code and map that Dart code back to the JavaScript code that the browser is actually running, which is really, really cool. So I want to show you an example of the JavaScript code that we output when you compile Dart to JavaScript. It's almost a one-to-one. -one. It's, it's really good these days. Here's an example here. We've got a class. We're importing a library. Uh, now, this isn't the, I had to cut out some boilerplate that we don't, we don't care about here. But for the feature of the code that you write here, almost a one-to-one. -one. So the code, you can sort of read this and actually help debug it. But of course, you want to ship down as small as code as possible. Well, Dart to JS ships with minification out of the box. So here's an example of the previous JavaScript code that you saw, which is generated by Dart to JS, and then minified here because Dart to JS can do a whole program analysis. He really understands the structure of your Dart app, more so than, say, a minif minifier for JavaScript. And so he can produce very small minified code. We also talked about this concept of tree shaking. Minification works great for the code that's produced. How do you make that smaller? But what about when you have a very large application, say an application that pulls in very large libraries? Well, if you look at any JavaScript library today, the primary marketing material they have is how small they are. 
right? You've got jQuery comes in at 30K. 30K, gzipped minified. And you might only be using 10% of jQuery. Should you be paying for the other uh, 90%? And then you've got you know, a whole competition, Zepto, Nano, Femto, and all these. Well, I want to get in a world where I only want to pick a library based on how good it is and what it does for me, not how small it is. Because as you reduce the size, now you've pushed out features, and now I've got to go to another library and go get that other feature. Well, in Dart, because you can statically analyze the whole program, you can say, OK, these are the actual functions and classes that your program requires. I will prune out everything else. So here's an example here. Let's say you write the code in blue, and it imports a, a library in yellow. You only call one function from that library. But notice how there's a blue function that you wrote, you never call it. There's a function in yellow that uh, comes along with the import that you never call. Well, Dart to JS understands tree shaking. He can look across all libraries you've imported, all code that you've written, all paths through the system and say, well, actually, you really only need main, func2, and funcx. This is awesome. Now my tools are actually helping me. OK, so that's a little bit of Dart to JS and what he's doing to make things smaller and faster. Let's talk about the Dart VM and what we're doing there to make things faster. So a good way to think about why you see, like why a new VM and why much better performance in Dart VM is to understand that the language designers are also VM engineers. So that helps that they're designing a language in libraries that they can implement very efficiently. Things like explicit and static structure. In Dart, you scan through the code, you parse it. The program doesn't change after that. In JavaScript, the program executes as you load it, and potentially it changes as you go. So it's very hard to optimize that. In Dart, you have real arrays, real classes. It's the, all the literature is all about how do you optimize object-oriented VMs. In Dart, you have direct calls. You don't have to walk a prototype chain to figure out uh, who might handle this. And by the way, did my prototype change at runtime out underneath me? And do I have to de-opt and throw away all my optimized code, et cetera? That can't happen in Dart. In Dart, you can globally track field types. This list goes on and on, but the analogy here is the version on the left here is kind of traditional web programming today. We've got a lot of baggage, just like 10 plus years of, of stuff going on here in JavaScript engines. But in Dart, you're kind of zooming along with the tiny little suitcase with wheels on it. So that's cool. The other nice thing about introducing your own VM is not only can you design a language that runs really fantastically on it, but you can kind of give developers keys to unlock whole swaths of transistors that today you cannot access. And it's a real shame. And this isn't just for super beefy you know, CPUs. Even cell phones today have whole swaths of SIMD instruction sets that you cannot access today. And we want to give developers access to the whole CPU. Again, it's not just about uh, pure performance. It's about battery, too. So here, uh, the Dart VM unlocks the SIMD instructions, uh, which is something like 25% of, of this ARM CPU that you can now access in Dart. So what does this mean in real life? Well, here's some recent benchmark numbers that we've been tracking. Blue is Dart VM. Yellow, the middle line, is Dart code compiled to JavaScript. I'm sorry. The yellow line is, is handwritten JavaScript code. And the green line is Dart code compiled to JavaScript. Now you can see the blue line significantly faster and sometimes 2x faster than the handwritten JavaScript code. And in some cases, and still very early with these numbers, the reason I'm showing you these is to show you the trajectory we're on. We think we can do better than this. But look at Delta Blue. That benchmark here, the compiled to JavaScript version, the green, is slightly faster than the handwritten JavaScript code. Now, this is, we're not going to expect this all the time. This shows you sometimes what can happen when you do a whole program analysis, look at the program, rewrite the code in a way that's friendly to JavaScript engines, better and smarter than developers would actually lay out their code. It's a lot like what GCC is doing for your C code, right? You write code for humans. GCC's job is to make it work fantastic on CPUs. Dart to JS does something similar. He looks at the Dart code and lays out JavaScript that's fantastic for JavaScript engines, smarter than you probably would yourself. But that was all on this you know, beefy MacBook Pro with 87 cores or whatever. So, but how does this translate down to phones? Again, sensing a theme here. Well, I'm happy to report that you see the same kind of performance characteristics and gains when you deploy your apps on phones as well. And this is an interesting benchmark here, nBody, because it's able to be accelerated by SIMD, those instruction sets that we can now provide you. In this case, we get an almost 2.5 performance increase running on the Dart VM thanks to both the design of the language and the VM, but also the SIMD instruction sets, over the handwritten JS code. And to see this 2 and a half times performance delta on mobile, where every CPU cycle counts, every battery you know, cell counts, 
It's pretty significant to, to our users. But this is only a short talk, and Dart is a complete ecosystem. There's tons of stuff I wish I had time to chat with you guys about. There's a whole server-side story in Dart as well. The Dart VM runs on the, um, on the command line as well as inside browsers. So much like Node shows you how you can write JavaScript that runs in both places, or GWT runs in both places, you can run Dart in both client and server. Again, the, the testing stuff is really, really rich. There's a whole uh, mocks, expectation, headless stuff there. Our whole concurrency story, we didn't go into at all. It's an isolate-based concurrency system. No shared state threads, so very much safer, and a ton more. So how do you try Dart? Well, Dart is an open source project. Uh, it's on Google Code and GitHub. You can download the SDK and the editor and our version of Dartium, all, everything on dartlang.org. We're active on, again, Stack Overflow and GitHub, Twitter, Google+. So we're hopefully where you are, so it's very, very easy to reach us, and we love the feedback. It's still, um, we're still not yet at 1.0. We hope to hit 1.0 this year, but it's still a lot of time for you guys to give us feedback. Like, what do you need? What other higher level libraries do you, do you want? What kind of APIs do you need to write those apps that users are demanding? We really want to hear that. So if you take anything away from this talk, I hope that you learned that Dart, good language, it's a stable language now. We don't expect to introduce any backwards breaking changes. Good libraries and stable core libraries. We don't expect to introduce any backwards breaking changes there either. Dart compiles to JavaScript, which means you can write a Dart app today and get it to work across the modern web. Dart is an evolved platform too. We're no longer kind of technology preview anymore. We're getting ready for 1.0. We've also been out since October 2011, so we've gotten a lot of feedback, internal and external. And so what you see here is an evolve from a lot of great feedback in real life usage. And also, Google and Chrome are committed to Dart. We've got important internal clients using Dart today. We've got on track to get Dart VM into Chrome, which is another great signal of commitment. And so this all leads up to Dart's ready for your app. Now's a good time to start using Dart. Try it out for an app you might be launching in about six months or so. Reach out to your community and let us know how, how it's all going. Hopefully you saw that it's familiar, it's productive, and it's ready for you guys to use. And with that, I'll say thank you very much for spending your time with me. I'll hang out for questions. I think we have a little bit of time for questions here. And if not, I'll be around. But thanks, everyone, for your time, and I appreciate it. Thank you.